Welcome to the Class Cast Podcast. I'm your host, Ryan Tibbins. Today, we'll be speaking with Neil McCluskey, the director of the Center for Educational Freedom at the Cato Institute. Neil has become one of the leading voices in the school choice movement, and so very lucky to have the opportunity to speak with him today and hear some perspectives about the benefits of school choice and some of the reforms that we've been talking about on the Class Cast Podcast recently. Neil, thank you for taking the time to join us. How are you doing today? Oh, I'm fine. Thanks for having me. Yeah, so we're, we're obviously going to be talking about school choice, but as, as we get into sort of the concept, I want to hit just a little bit of your background and how you got into this. So quick bio, you did undergrad at Georgetown, master's at Rutgers, and you have a PhD in public policy, correct, from George Mason? That's correct, yeah. So at what point in your ample education did education become your focus? Like if, if your degrees are poli sci, public policy, things like that, when did education really come into focus for you? Yeah, well, it was sort of a long time, pardon me, in coming. Uh, I, you know, I, I've always had an interest in public policy. And uh, at first it was politics, but I found politics got kind of gross. Uh, <laughs> and I, I was much more interested in the policy, the philosophy, the ideology, and not so much into ever becoming a politician in the end. It's a very long story, sort of how I got into education, but basically I was uh, out of college. I was in the military. I'd been in ROTC. Um, when I was in ROTC, uh, I observed uh, a lot uh, that I thought, well, maybe the education system could do a little better. Uh, when I got out of the army, um, I didn't know what I wanted to do. Actually, I did know what I wanted to do. Uh, I wanted to do public policy work, uh, but that would have required coming to coming back to Washington after school. So I tried my hand at teaching for a couple of years. And when I did that, I realized that my calling was really public policy. And I was working on a master's degree at the time and sort of serendipitous. I was writing a thesis about school choice. And I, in doing research, encountered a group uh, that was run by someone I was an intern for when I was in college. This, she ran Town Hall, which is now a very big website. When I was in college, there were no websites, but you could dial up to some things. Uh, anyway, and she had started a group called the Center for Education Reform. Uh, and I ended up working for her, I think in part because I knew her and because I had been doing research on education. And I had sort of become convinced that it made no sense to deliver education through uh, a government delivery model. It was at the Center for Education Reform, though, where I really kind of learned about a lot of the different policy debates. So, you know, I, I read about education policy. I had written this thesis on school choice. But that's where I started to read, because this was kind of my job, was to read all sorts of reports and put them in a database and, and distill them for people who need to know about it at the center. And so that's where I started to read about not just school choice uh, for private schools, but charter schools, standards and accountability reform, teacher quality issues, sort of the gamut of education policy issues. And as I learned that, I became sort of more libertarian in my leanings toward uh, education. Um, and then I uh, ended up meeting people at the Cato Institute. Um, and so that's when I started. I was at the Center for Education Reform for a couple of years, and I started working at Cato. Um, and more and more, I sort of became focused not even just on education and school choice, so school choice is most of what we do, but in particular, the impacts or the effects of different ways of delivering education on social cohesion. That's really kind of my most, the subject I'm most interested in. It's not what the public policy debate is mainly focused on. Uh, and so I've done a lot of work on that. But we still do work on, you know, what are the effects of school choice on test scores and things of that nature. But over time, I've become less uh, convinced that test scores tell us what people think they do and what public policy seem to focus on. Um, and But that's just sort of my trajectory was that I thought education was important. Public policy is really my thing. Uh, and I think that education is clearly important for social cohesion. Uh, because we're talking about how are we forming sort of the next generation of Americans, of people in your state, people in the world. And uh, I, I think that uh, it was really when I was working on my PhD that I became most interested in this question about social cohesion and 
there's something called contact theory about how people come together and how you build bridges among different groups as opposed to, you know, you got bonding, social capital, all that. I won't go into social capital right now. But anyway, so that was sort of the trajectory. Awesome. So I'm, I'm glad you brought up the, the social cohesion part because I've been thinking a lot about this. Um, I mean, really for a while, I mean, I'm in my 15th year teaching and, and you can only do the job so long before you realize that, you know, big parts of what schools are doing goes beyond say, what's going to be on a standardized test. There's a lot of just sort of human development. And when you think about schools, particularly in smaller communities, like where I live is, you know, there's one, one high school for the whole County, everybody goes there. And when I interviewed a guy running for you know, County Board of Supervisors, we talked about the roles of schools and school funding. And he, he really talked about how, especially in rural places, schools form kind of an anchor of the community. It's something that brings people together. Everybody goes to the same football games, everybody does all this kind of stuff. One of the, the things that I'm both curious about, and to be honest, a little bit worried about with the concept of school choice, is that for all the benefits of letting people choose the schools that fit them, fit their goals, et cetera, I worry about the ways we might be giving up some of those cultural functions of a school. And so for you, when you think, regardless of say the academic you know, benefits of school choice or the economic benefits, what do you see school choice doing to the sort of the fabric of a community and the way that young people come together, the way their parents come together? You know, for, for most people, your public schools are the, the most direct contact you have with your government, aside from paying taxes or God forbid you get pulled over, right? And so given that this is a really important part of how we interact with our government and with each other in the community, what is school choice likely to do to the way we form communities like that? Yeah, I mean, uh, I thank you for asking that because this is the question I like to talk most about. Um, and uh, the first thing I'd say is um, I talk a lot about school choice and social cohesion, but none of these are, no public policy issue is crystal clear. There are lots of very valid views on this. And so anything I talk about, um, I think it's absolutely reasonable to have lots of concerns. Um, and so like uh, something I would place over all education discussions, education policy discussions, no public policy discussions is, uh, there's a lot of legitimacy for what everybody has to say, I usually think. So um, that's just important as an overarching approach to these sorts of discussions. And so I certainly understand why people say, well, look, the, the school is an integral part of my community. Um, in many parts of the country, it's absolutely the case that, you know, Friday night football or something like that uh, really brings people together. The community sort of rallies around often sports, but around what the school does. And school choice isn't really a threat to that, in my estimation. The problem is not so much, well, how do you bring the nucleus of people together who tend to agree on things, who tend to share already a cultural background? My concern is, what is the right way for a system to deal with people um, or to incorporate people who aren't part of that sort of uh, that center, you know, the, the, the big part of the bell curve. How do you make sure people who want or need something different are able to access it? So if you're in a community where everybody rallies around that Friday night football, you're not gonna see many people use school choice. It's not really a threat to that public school or to that community. But in, in some places you have very diverse communities where people say, well, what that school is offering is not only not what I want for my child, which is important, but sometimes it's something that I absolutely don't want my child to have. And we have the argument for public schooling has long been, you can go back to Horace Mann and even before that, well, we need these common schools because they'll bring people together. They'll teach common morals. They'll teach them that they're all, you know, we're, we're all part of the same country and community. But throughout that whole history, you see lots of people who aren't already in that center of the bell curve for numerous reasons saying, well, this isn't okay for me. Uh, historically, you know, you first see this the most in the 1840s from Catholics who say, look, these schools are de facto Protestant institutions. That may work for most of you. It does not work for our kids. Um, you can see it with immigrants later, 
where there are, first of all, immigrants saying, I don't like that you are Americanizing my child in a way that they think that our culture is wrong, or the, you know, the food we eat or the language we speak. So the goal of school choice is to enable people who want something different to be treated equally. They don't pay for something and then have to pay twice for something else they want. And to eliminate the, the conflicts that we have to enter into when we don't agree. Uh, and probably the best example that's current of this is the, all the debates about this. Do you teach the 1619 Project? Do you teach the 1776 Commission? Do you teach critical race theory? That's the big kind of values and identity battles we're having right now. We're having lots of others. And so school choice isn't a threat to the cohesion of a community. What it is, is it's a way to teach people who need or want something different equally and to avoid a lot of the conflicts, which I think are ultimately divisive, that often rip at the social fabric, avoid those things so that we can have sort of a peaceful, harmonious coexistence. Okay. And I, I like how you say that. And this, I'm going to use a reference to the way this discussion goes in my classroom. Okay. And so keep in mind, I'm talking about 16, 17 year olds in, in an AP English class, obviously very different situation than you. I'm just curious how you respond to this. The first book I assigned at the beginning of the year is Justice by Michael Sandel, which is a nice sort of introduction to moral and political philosophy. You know, a lot of the kids, they just, they realize, wow, there's so many different ways to do the right thing. Like there's so many different ways to justify what is right or what is wrong. And then I set them up in groups and they have these big discussions, pick, you know, a handful of issues and argue it out. And in the end, you know, we oversimplify a little bit, but just to force, to make sure they're really arguing about it, is I make them decide which of his sort of three approaches to justice do they think is, is the best overall. And, and he basically breaks it down to freedom, to uh, welfare, and to virtue. You know, do we make decisions aligned with what makes people the most free to do what they want? What is best for sort of the general safety and welfare of people? And then what would be best for just sort of virtue, which he gets to at the end of the book because it's the most complicated. It requires a lot of a lot of thinking, a lot of knowledge, and then a lot of discourse for people to come to some agreement on it. When I'm talking to 16 and 17 year olds in that context about that discussion, what I find is not that I ever want them not to pick the freedom or libertarian approach. I want them to make sure they've considered the others because without fail, the groups that finish these discussions and activities first are the ones that go to the libertarian response because they essentially say, it's the easiest one because you let everyone do what they want. And I said, that's good, but your job is to tell me why it's the best, not why it's the easiest. And so as you point out, say using that sort of approach where everybody has the choice and, and, and the funding essentially to get the education they want, why is that best? Because in the end, you're saying we're not tearing at sort of a social fabric, but that implies that in certain ways we're okay with, you know, say instead of tearing a blanket, we're okay with just having two blankets. Is it the best approach to give people that freedom? Or is it in the end, the easiest from a policy perspective? Did, I don't know if I explained that well. Does that make sense? No, I get it. I can tell you from my experience, it feels like the hardest thing from a policy perspective. <laughs> yeah, that's a very, very different perspective than the 17 year old who's encountering all this for the first time. Right? Yeah, at least getting it seems pretty hard. Although we've yeah. made some progress uh, in the last, well, actually just the last week. But I mean, I think you've got to go to some extent the first principles and you have to think about, well, what is the role of government in society? I think if you look at the American founding, that the fundamental value, the root baseline value is liberty. And of course that makes sense because the one thing that you cannot reduce further in society is to the individual person. Ultimately, it is individuals who make decisions. We can be parts of groups, absolutely. You can be part of your family, you can be part of your church, but ultimately you can only, can, you only have your mind over which you have control you only have your own, uh, your own life that you can say, I'm going to walk away. I'm not going to walk away. And so if that's the case, if you know, the, the irreducible part of society is the individual, then liberty should be the first thing. We don't, it wouldn't, I think, seem right if we said, well, you don't get to make decisions for yourselves. We, the collective, will make a decision for you. I think if we think about it, that becomes very problematic very quickly and becomes unjust, especially if you're the person who is being told by others 
you know, this is what you'll do. This is how you live. This is what you have to think, or at least you have to say you think. Uh, and so if the first principle says liberty makes sense as the first most important good, the ability of that individual, the, the one thing that's irreducible to make decisions for themselves, to the extent that they don't impose themselves on others, which is kind of basic libertarianism, you should be able to make decisions for yourself, but it doesn't mean you can force people to do what you want. You can't defraud them or cheat them to do what you want, but otherwise you make decisions. If that makes sense, then within education, the, our assumption should be, well, the starting point at least must be individuals being able to make decisions for themselves about education. But of course that gets complicated. So I just gave the easy libertarian answer, but when we're talking about kids, it gets a little harder because we assume that kids, you know, depending on their age, it can change, but uh, we assume that kids can't make a whole lot of decisions for themselves. As they get older, they can make more, but the five-year-old, we typically assume they can't decide, well, I want to go rent an apartment and become an electrician tomorrow, and so I'm going to do that. Um, and so it gets a little harder, but our default should be liberty. So then the next question is, well, if our default is liberty, does it make more sense to let parents make decisions and then you have diversity, you get as close to liberty as you can get, and you, you uphold diversity, which means you know, not just diversity by race or by culture, but by diverse thought. Is that the default or should the default be, well, because it's not individuals, the government makes a decision for everyone. I think it still makes more sense to say, no, we're decentralized. We allow unique families, unique communities to live as they think is right. That then gives people lots of options to choose from and how to live. And it avoids a very dangerous situation of government decides, well, no, this X is the right, right way to live. Y is the wrong way to live. And we can look at most of education history and we can see public schools saying, yes, X is what you do. Y is what you don't do picking winners and losers and something that government groups of people don't, aren't really competent to decide for everyone. And remember when government makes a decision, it enforces it ultimately at the barrel of a gun. Only government can legally jail you or even legally execute you. And so when we look at it that way, I, I don't see how we escape that the default should still be school choice. You do no want, uh, you don't want a government to be able to impose one answer about things on everyone. Now, the, the next part about that, which sounds like it works in your classes, well, but public schools can present students with all sorts of different options, different things to think about and let the students make those decisions for themselves. The problem is that is not always what happens. And there is a limit to how many options you can present. And often parents and different communities feel like, well, I don't trust the schools to do that. Right. Yeah. And, and I, I like how you sort of point at, at the founding principles and, and, you know, think what is the root cause or the root, the root goal of all of this. Um, that's actually, I, I play, uh, I usually wait, we don't do it at the beginning of the year. I usually wait until we get to like Thoreau and civil disobedience and we, we sort of talk it out and I throw a couple excerpts of John Stuart Mills on Liberty at him and, and remind them, you know, like, how many of you care about defending minorities and, you know, whatever race, sex, gender, et cetera. And, you know, and, and all the hands go up and, and usually the most liberal students have, you know, the hands raised the highest uh, or, you know, waving and things like that. And then I always ask, what's the smallest minority, you know, and it takes, sometimes it takes them a minute, but we get, it's the individual, right? It's the smallest minority. And so if you want to defend the minority, then you have to defend the individual. And that's where, that's why I am sort of stuck on the fence on this very issue, because I think that you can't, you can't do something that's good for society if it's bad for too many of the individuals in it, right? Like you can't, you, you, how can you treat a group well if you're treating the individuals that compose the group poorly? However, um, when you think about something as large as say school systems or the things that require, whether it's the funding, the manpower, the real estate, in some cases, whatever it is, it usually looks like some degree of organization is ideal. And so it, it gets, that's where I get stuck on like, what's the best way to implement a system that provides access to these opportunities. Now, before we jump into the rest of that, and that's really, I think, a lot of what we're going to be talking about here, you talked about the purpose of government. And before we continue on, because we're having a conversation sort of at the nexus of government and school, to you, what is the purpose of a school? 
Like what are, what are we trying to do with formal education? Obviously people learn a ton on their own, but when we're having a discussion about say school choice, thinking about the formal sort of institutions we create to help develop people in your mind, what is the purpose of school? Yeah. I know we're going to get back to this, but interestingly, I talk about how the, uh, that public schooling, this idea that we all should be part of one system. What, one of the longest running endless debates is what is the function, what is the purpose of education? What should these schools be doing? And that's because there's lots of disagreement on what the purpose of education is. Um, I, you know, I think that for myself, um, and I, I'm always careful, this doesn't mean I prescribe it as policy. When I say I want school choice, I really want people to be able to choose among myriad options uh, of what they think is best. And not only because it may be best for them individually, but let different ideas of what education should be exist and to some extent compete to see which uh, works best. But it strikes me that there, you know, there, there is something that there would probably be very widespread agreement on, although there are uh, even limits to this, is that we should be providing kids the basic building blocks they would need to become self-governing adults. Because, you know, we talk about, again, the uh, libertarian ideal is if you're able to make decisions for yourself, you should be able to, as long as you're not using force or fraud on other people. Um, we assume kids can't do that. And so I think what is owed to children is that they be given at least these basic building blocks where they can become self-governing. We run into lots of problems, though, when that goes beyond uh, reading, writing, and some level of math, uh, I am not an expert in math, so I, I haven't been able to draw the line of what is the right amount. Um, but those would be the basic building blocks, that they can communicate, that they can read so they can learn about lots of other things, and that they can, you know, do math. I wish I had a better way of putting it, but do math. We'll go with that for now. Yeah. Um, and that would be the building blocks they need to become self-governing. Now, presumably, most people choose more than that. But the problem is, once you go beyond that into science and history, you start to get into some very controversial things, that it's dangerous to have government prescribe the right answer, and that we end up having a lot of conflicts over. But I think we can agree that the first thing is they should have those skills. And I actually think there should be a government role in ensuring that everybody gets those basic skills. And if parents aren't providing that, the government should intervene to make sure that those kids are being given those building blocks. Then the next thing for me would be, you know, I do think you need that to not just have those skills, but before you can think critically about a lot of things, you got to have content. So I think that, you know, it, what I would choose for myself would be, uh, you know, a lot of good uh, English classes with a lot of good readings. You know, some of that is classic, so you could be culturally literate. So you'd want, you'd want that. I think you want readings beyond that. I think it's really important people understand history. Uh, I spend a lot of time doing, in, when I do policy work, of looking at history. I think that that's really the key to, uh, to understanding a lot of different issues. So I'd want a lot of that content. But my own sort of inclination, and the thing I probably would have enjoyed most when I was in school, you know, in K through 12, I, I like to do a lot of arguing. And I would have liked, uh, you know, an education where a whole lot more was based on discussion and argumentation. Not that we didn't have some, and you know, I argued whether I was supposed to or not. But that's kind of what what I liked was, you know, the back and forth with people who did, you know, often would disagree with me. But sometimes it's just because I like to spout off. <laughs> um, but that's what I enjoyed. So, and the role of government, I think, is only to make sure though that the kids get those basic building blocks. Otherwise, it's neglect. And I think government has a, certainly a role to intervene when kids are neglected. It's it's really funny how like running a podcast like this, I, I have these conversations and every month or two, I, I realize I'm saying something slightly different than I said before. And I, I don't end up crediting anyone in particular because I just, I've had the conversation enough. I decide, well, I must have thought this all along and that's not true. <laughs> but I, I find myself on going to four R's instead of the old three, the reading, writing, and arithmetic. Mm -hmm. And I want rhetoric involved because reading and writing is great, but like, I actually want you to be able to like look at argumentation and do it. And that, that's really, that's most of my class. I would agree with almost everything you just said there. My question in, in regard to say the government role, 
I don't know how this factors in either to the policy piece or maybe to the ideals of the Cato Institute or, you know, whatever else, but you say there, there comes a point there where the government does have, the, there is some legitimacy to stepping in to making sure that young people are provided those basic building blocks. One of the first, uh, a couple of the first conversations that I had dealing with the concept of school choice before I'd given it any real sort of serious thought dealt with ideas of homeschooling and unschooling. And, and I know that a lot of people who are advocates for school choice do, whether they would choose it for their own children or not, sort of respect other people's rights to do so. I think in most cases, those students are getting the reading and the writing and the math and, and they're doing that. However, if we were to go to say, you know, school choice where essentially the parents choose more or less whatever they want, how do we know say if someone chooses homeschool, like for as bad as standardized tests are, they do at least give us a glimpse at like, are you literate? Can you do some basic math? We do get at least some basic data out of it. If a, a large group of people say in a community chooses to unschool their children or to do homeschooling with their own self-created curriculum, is there any way for us to know if those students are adequately being provided those basic building blocks that you said, and that I agree are the, are the, the foundational sort of parts of education. Like, is there a system of checks and balances we could create that allows for choice without restricting it, but you see what I mean, but still ensures that students are getting those basic things? Yeah. Well, this is kind of, I think in part where the genius of federalism may come in. So federalism, of course, meaning, uh, you know, we have the central government with so, with specific enumerated powers, we leave the states to to make all other uh, decisions unless they want to let the power authority uh, stay with the people or lower levels of government. But if you look at homeschooling statutes, they're very different in each state around the country. And so, in part, we we see these laboratories of federalism giving us different ideas of how you may be able to have a check and balance on on homeschoolers. So some states require that if you homeschool, uh, that you, that your child take a standardized test. It could be the state standardized test. It could be a nationally norm reference test. Some require submission of the portfolio. Some don't require anything. And so the first thing I'd say is the mechanism that you want, uh, at least from a political standpoint, to find out what works is to let all those different laboratories of democracy work. Then though, you, you do get into a pretty, uh, interesting philosophical discussion, which uh, I've been a part of. We had an event, uh, maybe it was six months ago now, I, I can't remember exactly, but a professor at Harvard, uh, Elizabeth Bartolet, you may have heard of her, you might have talked with her. Um, she had an article came out that said, uh, essentially the default should be against homeschooling. You should have to do a lot to be able to homeschool your kids. And this has led to a very interesting discussion about, well, what is uh, the, the baseline of government intervention in a family to see whether or not kids are getting an adequate education? Uh, this has now been also coupled with, uh, there has uh, been an ongoing debate about yeshivas for Orthodox Jews, particular Orthodox Jews in New York City, uh, where some people who went to those schools uh, said, we were not adequately educated. We weren't given the tools we need if we wanted to leave the community when we got older. And part of that is saying, you know, we were taught Yiddish, we were taught Hebrew, but we weren't taught English very well. And so this has also brought us into a focus on to, well, what is the right role of government? But I think that we have sort of established how government is supposed to determine whether something criminal has happened. And, and in what I set up, it would be criminal, a crime, to not give your kids those basic building blocks, the math, uh, the, in the reading, the writing, and the math. Uh, and there's a great question about reading and writing in what language. We don't have to get into that right now. But <laughs> so then, well, what do we do then when to deal in criminal law just generally? Well, we don't say we're going to send an inspector to everybody's house to make sure that they're not doing something criminal. You know, nobody comes to my house to make sure uh, that I am feeding my kids nutritious food or something. We have to have somebody with a reasonable suspicion that there's something wrong. And I think that that should be the default for homeschooling is somebody observes the child and says, look, this child, I, you know, they're, 
nine or 10, you know, and I may be the neighbor and I, you know, I wrote something down for them uh, and they, they couldn't read it. Or, you know, probably if they're not doing a good job educating, you're going to find a whole lot more basic problems like this child doesn't have uh, proper clothes, seems to be malnourished and things like that. But even if you don't have those things, you'd say, I, I spoke with the kid and they didn't seem to speak very well. And so you would have somebody with a reasonable suspicion that something criminal is happening, and then they would inform the authorities, and the authorities would investigate. And then they, if their investigation uh, came up with sufficient evidence, they felt they could charge the family with a the crime. They, they make that charge. And then the family gets their day in court. And then also, if they're found guilty, appeals, you know, the whole judicial process. And that is the way criminal justice is supposed to work. And I think that would be how it should be applied to education, to homeschooling. There should be a presumption of innocence for those families that choose to homeschool and only intervention if there's evidence that they're not doing what they're supposed to do. But like I said, this is a, I mean, this is a terrific, tricky area and it's totally understandable why people say, well, we may need more than that. Um, but I think we need to stick with the, the principles that we believe are correct for how we establish the relationship between individuals and families and communities and government. Yeah, that's great. And and you, you sort of applied an idea that I've had sort of a big picture national level kind of idea I've been kicking around that you just applied on the very local and individual level, which is really interesting. You know, I'm always like taking notes here. I always know I'm having a good discussion. If when I'm done, I go, ah, now I got to spend two hours tonight reading and thinking about this stuff. So we're already on that track. That's good. <laughs> but I've, I've sort of, with, with, with just a couple of exceptions, I've generally been making the argument for a while that the federal department of education is not that it's an awful idea, but that really its most important functions could and maybe should be executed by the Department of Justice. Like a lot of the things that we, we have concerns about, um, you know, access to schools in impoverished communities, racism and access to access to schools, things like that. A lot of that could very easily fall under Department of Justice jurisdiction. And, and to your point, a lot of that would really be state, not federal anyway. The idea, though, that we've created a Department of Education at the federal level to do a job that could have easily been done, just do people have fair access or, you know, young people being treated safely, fairly, et cetera, could, could really do that. In terms of, say, the switch from current public schools, which, you know, on, on paper anyway, are desegregated, but because, I mean, housing in the United States is incredibly segregated where schools are as segregated now as they've really been since the 1960s. Right. And so you, you can make the argument that when people say, well, school choice may result in less diversity in schools in some cases. Yes. I think that's a concern in other cases I say, but students are already going to like massively segregated schools based on where they live, right? And that's, that's, that's sort of a big historical issue. When we think about applying concepts of school choice and saying, okay, well, you know, regardless of, of the funding mechanism in place, young people or families are going to be able to apply to different schools, go to different schools. You always have the opportunity to go back to your public school, assuming, you know, it's still there, all this. Uh, what's your take on the race issue? Because as you pointed out in your sort of learning and discussions of this, you, you spend a lot of time talking about history. And what I found is that the people who are the staunchest defenders of public education in this, in this context, talking about school choice are almost always historians of some sort, like current classroom teachers, my, my coworkers have very little interest in this conversation, which I honestly find alarming, but most of those academics who have concerns about school choice point to sort of early forms of it in the 1950s, 1960s, et cetera. And so my question to you is if say we're going to rely on the neighbor to point out, Hey, this kid isn't reading well, what would we do? Would we do anything at all? If a school was demonstrating a, you know, a, a preference for or against students of particular races or ethnicities, right? Right now we're all kinds of segregated, but hey, we, well, hey, look at the boundary lines, right? You, you have an easy explanation for it. When the boundary lines are no longer the explanation, what could or should we do to prevent that? Or is that something that we just sort of let be part of the system? Okay, can I address the Department of Education thing first? You've just yeah, no, absolutely. Two, Sorry. two of yeah. my favorite topics. And so, uh, <laughs> yeah, sometimes I, I get on a roll. I ask you too many things at once. Sorry. <laughs> well, that's okay, because you mentioned the Department of Education, and you said something that leads me to plug the paper we did, although for the 
life of me, I can't remember what the title is, but <laughs> um, uh, I and several people, Lindsay Burke at the Heritage Foundation, uh, Jamie Gass at the Pioneer Institute and some others, right before the pandemic, were working on a paper about how do we right size the federal role in education? And what's interesting is what you said is exactly one part of the paper, which is uh, one of the things that the federal government should be involved in that has a legitimate role under the 14th Amendment is civil rights uh, enforcement. There we go. And we uh, recommend that the Office of Civil Rights, which is the office within the Department of Education that handles that, that it should be in the Department of Justice. Otherwise, the Department of Education is primarily a place where money is given out. Uh, and actually, the biggest part of that is not K through 12. It's higher education student loans. But I just want, since you mentioned it, I wanted to give a shout out to that paper, but also that I think that that makes a lot of sense. And I've seen, I wouldn't say it's across the whole spectrum because not that many people talk about where should the Office of Civil Rights be placed. But I feel like I've seen people on various parts of the spectrum say, it makes a lot more sense to put civil rights enforcement in the Department of Justice than the Department of Education. So I just thought I'd, I'd run yeah, with that that's because- great. Yeah. Uh, we do some work on on federalism and the federal role in education. Uh, I did write a book. It was a long time ago, but uh, called Feds in the Classroom that was really about this, although it got into a lot more history and things like that. OK, so that's the Department of Education. Um, so now the, when you talk about sort of diversity in schools and social cohesion and segregation. This is where things get both very interesting. I think that this is an extremely important topic, but it also lends itself to demagoguery pretty quickly. And so it's hard sometimes to have this conversation, but I'll tell you what I think. Um, so much of what I have done is because I have seen historians, I had seen people involved in education policy just say, Public schools are the bedrock of our democracy. They've what, taken diverse people and made us into a unified whole. And I look at history and say that is just not accurate. And at least I feel like my experience, and of course I have a bias, so maybe I'm not seeing all this, but I feel like when I say in policy debates, show me the, the evidence that these schools have brought diverse people together, they don't usually show me the evidence. And when I've looked for it, uh, I don't often find it, even among people who are saying it's true. So there's a historian named Johan Neem, who you may know, and I hope I'm saying his name right. Uh, he's out in Washington State, but he wrote a book recently that I read that basically uh, the thesis, at least his introduction was, you know, these public schools often, they take diverse people and they make them a cohesive whole. But then the actual history part of it said, well, that's not really what happened, at least up to 1868 or whenever he was covering. And I hope I'm not confusing it with another book because I, I read a fair number of history books. But he said, you know, actually what most schools did was they, uh, kids went there. It was sort of an obligation. They didn't really become interested in being citizens or anything other than sort of graduating and finishing. And, and so even that he was saying, there's not a lot of evidence that this had forged citizens. You know, that's what Horace Mann said was going to happen was these are going to forge citizens. You can look even before Horace Mann. Um, uh, there's a collection of essays, which I you know, I, I should highlight, um, but lots of even sort of early national people, so 1780s, 1790s, saying, you know, we should have public schools to forge common citizens and um, to uh, instill in people um, sort of goodness in them. Um, Civ um, civic virtue? Something like virtue, that? that's the go. word I want. <laughs> they didn't say civic virtue, they said virtue. And why I can't remember virtue is beyond me uh, in any event, but they would it will make them virtuous kind of American citizens. And so that was the goal. And but we don't see that. And that's what Neem was talking about. What we also don't see is historically, you don't see a whole lot of people from different groups actually being brought together. So for most of our history, public schooling was a very, very local affair. You lived in a small community, you had a, a school that was often your church in the small community, and the small community tended to be very homogeneous. 
um, there wasn't a lot of diversity. Why? Because people tend to live with people like themselves. The reason we have segregation housing now is in part, certainly, lots of bad housing policy that led to segregation. But there's a whole lot of evidence that shows that people also tend to want to live with people like themselves because they're more comfortable. You're more comfortable when your neighbors speak your language, you have a similar culture, so you live a similar way. Um, and so there's also sort of a natural inclination of this. Um, and for much of our history, when you're talking about immigrants, immigrants tended to settle in small communities which makes absolute sense uh, because you need a way to transition from your old way of living to an entirely new country with new culture, new language. And the easy, the way to ease into that is you live with people like yourself. Um, and so we haven't had a situation in America where there has been a whole lot of diversity in schooling in part because for most of our history, you had very small districts that tended to have very homogeneous communities. And of course, when we didn't have homogeneity, we often had conflicts. Again, the sort of, the one that stands out the most when you're talking about the 19th century is religion, in particular Roman Catholics and Protestants, although there were also debates among different kinds of Protestants about what the school should be. Presbyterians were, were working on creating a large parochial school system. Lutherans had a large parochial school system, but we tend to think most of Catholics because that's where the most fundamental, at least within Christianity, divisions were. Um, and so we had lots of battles over that, and eventually you end up with a separate Catholic school system because many Catholics said, I just cannot tolerate this education system. So we separated. Of course, we segregated by law many people. We didn't allow African-Americans in many places to get an education at all. Then we had segregation. And in some parts of the country, it wasn't just African-Americans who were segregated. There was, if you go to the West or the Southwest, there was segregation of Hispanics. There was segregation of Asians. And so we had people naturally separating and then we had forced separation. And so now you go to the present era and we see that it's very hard to sustain integration that's kind of coerced. So busing, of course, led to lots of conflicts about busing. There's lots of important history about busing that said, well, people were happy to be bused if they were getting bused to homogeneous schools. And that's true. Right. But when it was busing people somewhere they didn't want to go, that's when they objected. It wasn't really, some of it was how long the bus ride was, but a lot of it was the destination. Yeah, where, where, where are my kids, who are my kids hanging out with, exactly. Yeah, and so we tried that, and what we saw is a lot of people didn't like it. If you look at polling, uh, nobody, very few people would accept busing, and it has long been the case. Um, and so you can't sort of force people together. And interestingly, uh, people will point to the South, and they say, but in the South, we had success at getting people of different races, and we're usually talking about black and white, into the same schools. But interestingly, there's been research done that showed, but within those schools, you see the most segregation. Part of it is social. Friendship groups tend to be segregated. And then within classrooms where you tend to have white kids in the more advanced classes, you tend to have African-Americans in the less advanced classes, and they have this separation. So we don't actually see meaningful integration in those schools. And so what I've sort of concluded is, it is really, really hard to have sustainable forced integration. So this is what gets to the school choice part of it. First of all, I think when we force people into conflicts, that divides us. I bet if you had talked to some of the capital rioters, they would have said, you know, one of the things that makes me bad is critical race theory put it into the schools. Um, whether they were right or wrong, I think critical race theory takes a, a bad rap. Um, but whether they're right or wrong, that seems to be something that is dividing us, is what is being taught in our schools. You could also, you know, you can go back in time, and you could talk about uh, evolution and um, creationism. We have lots of dividers. So what I think is, one, we want choice to avo avoid those sort of zero-sum forced conflicts where lots of people have to pay for one system of schools, but only one group gets to control what's taught. The other thing is, I think if we're going to have Meaningful integration, it has got to be voluntary. And this gets to something called contact theory, which was 
Uh, it's mainly attributed to a guy named Gordon Allport, who was a social psychologist in Harvard in the 1950s. Other people have talked about it, but he said, look, if we want to bring diverse people together, first of all, there does have to be contact. You have to actually get to know that your stereotypes about people are wrong. And the way you learn that they're wrong is that you actually meet people from that group. And you're like, you know, I always thought people from your group had these characteristics, but now I met an actual person. And it turns out it's not right. But he also hypothesized that if that contact isn't voluntary or, you know, by choice and in pursuit of common goals, you're all trying to, you have to work together to achieve something, get a couple other provisos, that it won't work, that it actually could become conflictual and divide you more. And I think school choice fits within those provisos in that the contact cannot be forced. It has to be equal status too, which is why it can't be forced. You can't assume that, well, one child is put in a school because they're considered lower status and they have to be with these higher status kids that automatically divides people. And I think choice would start to provide some glue, something that attracts people that gives them a common identity that would overcome something like race. So it may be religion. It may be that you all want to be artists. So you go to an arts-based school, but you need something to, to create that bridging capital. If you want to talk about social capital, Right. where we say, look, okay, we may be from different races, but we both chose this school and we both want to be, you know, we want to be great artists. We really care about art. We're really interested in art. Now we have a shared identity. That shared identity is we have this interest in art and there's not this difference in status. And so I think school choice is actually the key to sustainable integration. Not that it's going to happen very fast, I don't think the education system is the primary driver of integration. I think that lots has to happen outside of education. But within education, I think that it, it's the way to start having that ability to build new overarching identities without all the conflict. Right. But it's going to take time. Yeah, we're here because we want to be. We've chosen the school, the, you know, the philosophy, whatever. Now, with that, there are plenty of places and and some sort of, you know, locally say in the DC metro area where there's been some debate over students getting into very selective, say governor schools, magnet schools, things like that, where they look at the number of students who have applied uh, from different racial groups, different economic groups compared to the admissions. And in some cases, you know, you can point to different test scores, et cetera. But in some cases, there doesn't seem to be a lot that differentiates the students. And we see some, you know, some disproportionate admissions, you know, and, and this is what the the lawsuit at, was it Harvard or Yale? I think Harvard, right? They both uh, have one. They both, yeah, yeah. I don't, yeah. I forget which one was bigger, but right. So they both yeah. had, you know, concerns with um, Asian American students suing, essentially saying they've been kept out by, you know, a, sort of a de facto quota system. When we think about this in terms of public education K through 12, I, you know, I love what you're saying about let people choose where they want to be. And some of this over time, it might take a while, but some of this would work itself out. My question is, if the government, whether it's through you know some sort of voucher system or something like that, if we're providing funding, would you be supportive of some measure that would allow for, say, the Department of Justice or maybe it's a state level to ensure that there's some degree of equity in the admissions? And I, and I say that because I think it's pot, like in my experience, very limited. I mean, I grew up in Pennsylvania. I live in Northern Virginia. I have never worked in California or in Alabama or whatever, you know, and so I, I can't speak to the, the situations. But in the conversations that I've had with people, I don't know anyone who says, I don't want anyone of this particular group in my, my school or my kid's school. But I do see sort of this implicit bias where I don't want the numbers to get too far off. There's a certain degree of tokenism that comes with this. We're like, hey, well, look, we have a few Jewish kids or we have a few black kids or we have, you know, whatever. And that's that's good. But in some cases, there are a lot of people who are maybe applying to these these schools, say, again, magnet schools, charter schools, things like that, who aren't getting in. Do you think it would be reasonable in exchange for being eligible to receive state or federal funding? You know, again, vouchers, whatever, whatever system we choose. Would it be reasonable to make that contingent on some degree of like equity oversight? Like you don't have to hit a quota, but if 50% of your applicants are Hispanic and you admit 8% of them, but more of them were qualified than that, like, would it be reasonable to say you're not eligible, your school's not eligible to receive the state or the federal funds? Like, that, like how, do we, how do we make sure that what you just talked about is sort of that, that slow growth towards hopefully eventually a more equal and equitable society? How do we make sure that those initial steps don't create a quick backslide 
you know, is, is there a method you could put in place to protect against that? Yeah. I mean, I guess the first question is a backslide from what? So I think when you look at the public schooling system, we don't have integration in terms of, you know, the schools, especially once you get to the classroom level, um, the schools don't appear to reflect uh, the demographic makeup of often their communities or the state or the country. And so when we say backslide is, I'm not sure we can backslide a whole lot further. Now, again, this, like you said, this isn't all the problem of the schools. There's a lot of housing policy and other things involved. Um, and so that's the first concern is I wouldn't want to hold private schools, even through a voucher program or some other school choice program, to some other, you know, some higher threshold than we have for the public schools. I, I do think it's reasonable if you have, you know, government money involved to say, well, you can't, you know, you can't discriminate. You can't say we will not accept uh, African-American kids, or we will not accept Hispanic kids. I actually think from a freedom perspective, even that is problematic, but it's certainly understandable why we'd say that as a baseline. But it gets much more harder, I think, once you start saying, well, do you have an equitable proportion? Because then we have to define what equitable means. I uh, am very, I'm concerned that you have things like in Fairfax County, Virginia, the Thomas Jefferson School for Science and Technology, which has one of these lawsuits that said, well, look, your admissions process has led to a lot fewer Hispanic and African-American kids and a whole lot more Asian kids than would be proportionate for this district. We see this in New York City. We're seeing the same thing in Boston and San Francisco and lots of places like that. I think it's problematic when a, a government, a school district has specialized schools um, that seem sort of elite and only some people can access them. But there is a great question about, well, what do we mean by equity? Because uh, Asian Americans I, tend to, to say in these debates, well, look, the right measure is our academic ability and our academic ability is best measured by something objective like a standardized test. That's what you see in New York City is a, is a test. Um, you know, colleges often use SAT, ACT. And that often seems to be the measure of our academic achievement and ability is what's on that test. And you can certainly understand why people say that. You'd say, look, as we saw in the Harvard case and elsewhere. Well, if you go beyond the test and you say, well, how did I do in my interview? Well, you've got interviewers making subjective decisions. You have interviewers who may have a bias against a particular group, even if it's subconscious. And so they say, well, so we can't use that. Other people would say, well, but a test only tells you for one thing, what is testable. And there's a lot you don't know about somebody by how well they fill in the bubbles or even write an essay. And those tests may be biased. So it can't just be a test. It should be an interview and a test. Well, so we say, well, what about, what about, what about a portfolio of work where we put together uh, you know, a bunch of essays we wrote, artwork, science projects, things we did, and we evaluate based on that. But then somebody said, well, that can be very subjective about what's a good science project or what's good, bad, or the you know, uh, art project. And so we actually have a very difficult time identifying what equitable would be. That's why it's so hard to have government making the decisions of you get to go to this school and you get to go somewhere else, because they tend to have to have one process to do that. And there, it does often look like the government is favoring one group and disfavoring another. And again, everybody pays taxes in Fairfax County for the Thomas Jefferson School, but only some people can access. And if you're paying tax, you're like, why can't I use, or my kids use that school? That's why I think a choice system would be better. You could have, and I think you would have schools using lots of different measures of what indicates that you would do well at this school. Um, it may be a test score. You'd have progressive schools that say, no, we wanna take everybody. It may be, you know, uh, it may be a portfolio of work. You want to have that decentralized decision making where lots of different things can be tried and nothing is being imposed on people. So I, again, I think that the school choice is better than government. And it becomes problematic, though, when government says, OK, you have school choice, but choice must be governed by this definition of equity, because we don't agree often on what actual equity is. Okay. And, and I, you know, I think some of that's fair. Um, 
no offense, part of that is dodging, <laughs> but be, just because it's, it's a hard, it is a hard question to answer, but at the same time, that's, it's a debate we're already having in public schools. And so if we want to move it to a choice, a choice system, I don't think saying choice from the applicant side like resolves it right i mean it, it does say i don't have to apply to this school if i think it's biased against me or you know it's biased for me it makes it too easy to get in etc so but but part of this then is is what is say a responsible use of public funds and, and you pointed to why you know is tricky to navigate and it's tough to do this well because we've developed a really really nasty bureaucracy surrounding all of this like you know anytime people talk about teacher pay i'm like look i don't want anybody out of work but i could make a lot more money if there were a lot more if there was a lot less middle management sort of sitting just above me and and that is one thing that on average you know charter schools and private schools have going for them is they're most of them are not real top heavy right but if we're thinking about applying public funding you know, one one while change in public education is relatively slow and, and, you know, tests show up and they hang around for 20 or 30 years and they disappear and 20 or 30 years later, those tests are coming back. But the public does through their elected officials, both local school board, state level, you do have some influence over it. So my, my question in terms of thinking about, say, funding, and I'm going to use vouchers just because I think it's the easiest one to explain, right? Like, we're going to figure out a dollar value every family, you know, every student in in the area, in the state, whatever gets that dollar value, you you choose your, your setting with it. Well, if we're not willing to hold the school to account on issues related to equity of access, and if we're going to say state by state, we might choose tests or not tests, you know, no tests at all, what stops this from being a long-term slide? Like this, by the way, this is my number one concern with, with school choice is that I worry that this is a step towards essentially the argument you say, well, look, people are using this money for all kinds of stuff. Like we've already seen some voucher systems where people are spending the money on clearly non-educational expenses and things like that. Does that kind of poison the well where in 20 years we have the same discussion, but school choice is a thing. And we say, but look how poorly people are using the money. People aren't using this at real schools. They're going to these schools and half these schools are poorly run. They're going out of business in a year or two anyway. How do we make sure that this isn't a sort of a, a first step towards essentially just defunding public education or just education in general? Like, how do we, how do we know that by going to school choice, which I'm open to, doesn't turn into a discussion in a decade or two of saying, but look, everybody's all over the place. This is fractured. The schools are weak or people are making bad decisions. Let's just stop funding it in general. Like where does that money come from? How do we ensure it if we don't have any assurances about how it's used or the schools that it's going to? Yeah. Well, the first thing I'd say is I, I can't, I am loathe to promise things 10 or 20 or 30 or 40 years down the line. <laughs> right, I, right. I, I rarely, you know, a lot of people like I predict X. I tend not to make predictions because one of the things I've learned is my mind doesn't have the ability to foresee everything that's going to happen in the future. Right. Uh, so I can't guarantee that what you're saying won't happen. And actually, I would not be surprised if we went to widespread school choice where people decide, you know what, a lot of what we were spending our money on before we may not need. Uh, I think it's Arlington uh, in Virginia. I'm sure there are others like this. I just have no Arlington because some of the Cato research it. I think they have like four or five planetariums in their school system or something like that. I may have the number wrong, but yeah. you sort of think, well, could they make do with one planetarium? Right. Um, and so you may find that there's just a lot of things that people wouldn't be willing to pay for. And that's good. In fact, we often look at things and we say, isn't it great that we can now get food a lot more cheaply and efficiently than we used to do it? We wouldn't say, well, I'm a little concerned because it used to be I had to have my own chicken to get a few eggs. And now I can just go get eggs at the grocery store. We have more eggs than we know what to do with. So I, I wouldn't say that if spending goes down, that's necessarily a bad thing. It may actually mean school choice is working because we're finding more efficient ways to do something. And that's good. That said, I don't see anywhere in history that people did not want to get some education. There were times when certainly uh, education didn't do them much good. If you had, a, you know, if you were in a surf in feudal Europe, you get education, you're not going anywhere with it. But once people had mobility, we saw people wanted education. When you go back in U.S. Uh, American, sorry, history, uh, you see that people were learning to read and to write before there were any public schools. Why? Because they could do something with it. For one thing, we have a printing press invented. 
people start to be able to get books and then eventually newspapers and things, and they want to use them. They want to learn how to read. They want the entertainment. And so people taught their kids how to read. They learned how to read. We saw education happening before it was public because it was in the, to the benefit of the people. Um, and it was very widespread. It wasn't just that only the rich learned. Uh, by 1840, so before there was a, a major public school in the United States, it was about 90% of white adults were literate. Of course, we had laws that said African-Americans could not be educated in many places. Um, but for the people we allowed it, that was a lot of education because it benefited them. So I don't see that we can look historically and say people won't still want education because education benefits them. And the education of your children benefits you. Of course, sort of biologically and chemically, you care about your kids um, for, for the most part. Obviously, there's some people where <laughs> things some. go wrong. Yeah. But uh, for the most part, that is part of the human condition is you are biologically triggered to care about your kids. So you care about their outcomes um, and you get them education. So I don't, I don't see in history that there's good evidence that if we were to move to all school choice, suddenly people would stop consuming education. In fact, one of my biggest concerns with vouchers is that, I, I mean, I like vouchers, but that we end up like in higher education where I think a lot of the student aid is actually fueled higher prices because schools see, hey, somebody could pay more for what we're providing. And we often see people actually demanding more because they have more money to use that actually has blown up higher education more, more, more expensive. So the other thing I can point to is we can look at higher ed and say, if there's school choice, we may actually see it become less efficient, which I don't want, but that's one part of it. So I, I just, I don't see historically or based on human nature that moving the school choice would lead to a backslide away from education. It may become more efficient or like higher ed, it may just have more stuff. But I, I don't see any evidence that going to a school choice model would, would lead to uh, a decrease in the amount of at least useful education people are getting. And, you know, yeah. there may be things that they have to go to learn that they just forget. And maybe those classes won't survive, but right. people will not stop educating. Yeah, I just I think, you know, like you use the, the, the food analogy, right? And I mean, in that one, you know. Uh, half the reason our food is cheaper is because of the way we write farm bills and we subsidize, right? So government is a big reason that food has gotten cheaper. Unfortunately, it's also the reason that I can get a cheeseburger cheaper than a salad in some places. So, you know, yeah, the costs are down because of the way we, we, you know, have some policy that affects it, but sometimes it also puts the targets in the wrong places for the higher ed thing. I, I agree. I think that the access to the funding is a concern. I also think we got to be careful because since, you know, in most places, since somewhere in the earlier mid 1980s, public funding of higher ed has gone down. I mean, you know, University of Virginia receives, I, I forget, like 30 percent, something like that of the funding that they receive from the state, uh, you know, just 30 years ago. And so I, guess I also do some higher ed work. And that is uh, a lot of people say that. Uh, actually, though, UVA and Virginia Tech uh, and William and Mary, one other, actually made a deal with the state of if you give us less money and give us more control over our own decisions, we'll take that deal. And it's also important to note that across higher ed, institutions have brought in a whole lot more money from other sources than their states. And so we've seen that percentage go down, not because the funding's been cut but because they're bringing in a whole lot more money from lots of other sources. I right. just sort of throw that in. No, no, and that's fair. And that's good. And that I, I appreciate that. Like that's, I, you know, I want to make sure I'm getting it right. But in the end, the same of the, the effect is the same on the student that that education is more expensive out of pocket. Right. And so it, is there, I, I just, my, my friends who, who advocate for school choice are also people who on average would advocate against property taxes. And for me, just real quick, like I never in my life questioned the idea of a property tax until I spent a lot of late nights at school. Like I just, I get it done there if I can. And I was talking with a custodian from El Salvador who he works all year. He works two jobs. And then every summer when the schools were out, he goes back to El Salvador and he's literally building his own house like brick by brick. And he explained the whole thing. I said, why? You know, like you said, it's safer here. You make more money here and whatever. He goes, because in the United States, you never own anything. And he goes, you're always paying the government taxes. He goes, you're, you're always renting your right to own your house. And he goes, so he goes, once I build my house, I'm going to retire in a place where I don't keep paying for it. And, I, and that, that hit me where I was like, wow, like I 
all of a sudden have a legitimate concern with the property tax. A lot of my friends who advocate for school choice are also opposed to property tax. Is there a way to maintain access to education when I, I, I certainly don't want to say everyone, but at least many, you know, some, many of the people who are advocating for school choice would also like to see those same taxes either reduced or eliminated. Does that present a threat to the people who can't on their own afford education? Like, I mean, it's really the equity question just in economics instead of race. Yeah. I'll have to, I have to draw a distinction. Maybe that is more of a libertarian argument than a standard school choice argument. So obviously there's overlap there, but there are a lot of people who support school choice who are not libertarians, who I don't think would argue for a decrease in taxes. Um, they just want to be able to have the money be portable so they can go to what is, they believe, a better school. Um, in fact, there's a whole pie division among school choice people about you know what is the purpose of school choice. So I'll answer this more from a libertarian perspective than say this is what school choice people think. Okay. There certainly is a case that libertarians tend to think that we are overtaxed. Um, uh, and I would agree that I think that we spend a whole lot of money on a whole lot of things that we don't need to spend money on and are probably overtaxed. Um, it's not my area, by the way. So I, I don't analyze entire budgets uh, that governments put out and be like, you know, we should really stop paying for bridges or something. Um, but so I think that there's an argument to be made that we're overtaxed. And then you have to have the discussion. Well, what are the things that we should be taxed for? Uh, and I would you know I, I'm a pretty libertarian guy. I do think that uh, it is important that people start putting some of their own money to education. I, so I would say I would even be OK with if we say, look, maybe we tax for education at the state and local level. Well, I should say the state level because I'm going to add another wrinkle to this just to complicate things. Um, <laughs> but I would say, look, people get a voucher and maybe they're responsible for paying some amount on top of that, which there's research that shows that invest people more actually in what they're choosing and leads them to make smarter choices uh, or more disciplined choices than if they did we could have a whole discussion about that. The property tax, though, issue is particularly interesting. I, From a libertarian perspective, I can't say that I've heard a lot of libertarians target the property tax. I feel like libertarians tend to be like, I hate all taxes, no matter <laughs> right. what level. Although most of what they talk about is federal taxes and the income tax. And there's mm -hmm. a lot of problems with the income tax. So now, uh, just to confuse things more, I'll go back to the school choice part of this. I actually think that there is probably some agreement among people who like school choice and people who are in education policy who don't like school choice, who would say the property tax is a terrible way to fund education because that means basically you choose a school by where you choose a home. And that makes it very regressive because wealthy people buy a home in a wealthy district. They can put all sorts of money in their schools where other people, if they want to access that district, they have to be able to pay for that entire home. And to have your tuition be the cost of a McMansion seems a little ridiculous. Um, and I, I understand historically why property taxes paid for these things because public school districts used to, again, be very small, very local things that individual communities would would maintain. But I think you could probably find agreement among school choice people and people not for school choice to say, let's end this property tax funding and maybe go to all state level funding. And I could even imagine a compromise where school choice people or libertarian types say, okay, we'd be, we'd be fine with getting rid of this local control if the money were, was something that families could take to whatever school they chose. Um, maybe that's a compromise. That I, don't, I haven't seen it floated as, as a realistic possibility, but it, I think a lot of people recognize that there's something fundamentally problematic of having your school be so intimately tied to where you can buy a home. Yeah, that, that's when I talked with um, Chris Stewart, Citizen Stewart, a few weeks ago. That was he, he talked about people voting with their feet, you know, and essentially, you know, like where I were, I work in Loudoun County, but I live in Clark. I live to the county west. You know, I was just like, I can't afford it. I'll 
make sure my kid can read, <laughs> like we'll figure it out. Um, but it, he talked about people having the ability to sort of choose their schools by just picking up and moving. And he said, not everyone has, has that opportunity. Just, I'm just curious. This is an idea I've been kicking around and I, I haven't heard any big opposition to it, but um, it, you, you talked about sort of the compromises that it might take to make something like this reality, you know, where we go from sort of the philosophical level of, you know, what's the right thing to do and how might this work to actually thinking about the politics and the policy of it. Do you think that exchanging a universal teachers union for school choice would, would work? Because I think on average, most teachers, you know, most teachers don't want to work in a place that looks you know where we're not teaching good content or where it's clearly segregated or whatever else do you think that that would be one of those things where hey we can do a very sort of free school choice but allow teachers to collectively bargain from public and private together as a way to ensure some quality from the educational side of it or would that create a bigger headache than it's i just the people who push hardest for unions tend to push hard against school choice and vice versa would that be a reasonable trade-off to make both sides equally happy and unhappy and maybe create progress. Yeah, so it's an interesting idea that I hadn't thought about before. So this will all be sort of my initial reactions. The first reaction was, I can't imagine most school choice people going for that because to many school choice supporters, the number one enemy is is the teachers union. Uh, And I don't think as a philosophical matter, they should be, but as a practical matter, it's totally understandable because they are the most potent political force opposing school choice. I don't think they're the biggest. I actually think people who tend to live in these kinds of districts where you buy a nice house and you get into that school district, they tend to, I think, be the the biggest group of people with political clout who just don't want school choice. Not they spend a lot of time on it. They're like, why would I want that? Um, But in terms of political actors, I think people think the unions are the number one problem. Um, I, I don't, my other... I would be very concerned about the idea if there were a universal union that there would be, and maybe this isn't what you're getting at, but sort of a universal contract that all schools would follow because that would, uh, I think, essentially kill the, the value of school choice, which is different schools being able to try a lot of different things, which includes different ways of hiring, um, different ways of having teachers involved in the running and the governing of schools and things like that. So I think that would be problematic. And then I'm not actually sure the NEA and the AFT would go yeah, for that. I don't think they would like it. I, I, I just, I, I explain, I always tell students that compromise, like we always talk about compromise should make everyone a little bit happy. And I say, really, in my mind, we get more done if we're willing to make everyone equally unhappy and get an end result that's closer to what we all wanted. So like, can we take a step closer to what we all wanted? And in the end, we have equal number of things to complain about. And I, I think that, that that's, this sort of splits the difference a little bit. I don't think that anybody involved actually will like the idea I just proposed. I just see it as a way to like, you know, because one of my concerns, I, I, I love the idea of school choice. I kind of like the idea of doing it more as a public charter system. I wish we had more ex- experimentation in schools. Schools are far too homogenous that, you know, you can walk into a school, watch Leave it to Beaver, and then walk into a school today and it's the same thing, but with a laptop, mm-hmm. you know, like the fact that we don't change and do more interesting things or, you know, have students more involved, I think is, is a crime. But how do you change it? You know, so that's where the choice thing is very appealing to me. On the other side, I also know that, you know, average pay benefits, hours worked and things like that from the teacher perspective, it usually does not go up as you go into private schools and charter schools, unless you're very expensive, you know, sort of selected places. And so that that's sort of both me as the, my teacher bias, but also thinking like what allows for progress and more freedom without maybe running some of the other risks that can potentially come with it. But to your point, yeah, I don't think anybody, (laughs) I don't think anybody in position to make the call would like it. Well, these are some interesting points. Uh, There is some research that shows where there is more competition among schools, so where there's more school choice, it leads to higher teacher pay because schools are competing to be the best. And so they they will compensate their teachers more. Uh, I think the reason that you see pay generally in private schools is lower. and also charter schools to some extent, although I haven't looked at charter schools as much because I'm more interested in private schools, but it's because it is really, really hard to compete with something that is free to the person using it by charging them. So schools, most private schools, obviously you have Sidwell friends and the other big ones that have really a different niche that they're, they're 
aim toward. But a lot of the schools, the Catholic schools, Christian schools, just smaller private schools, they need to compete on price. And that's really hard to do uh, if you have to charge and the schools you're competing against don't. So they don't have a whole lot of money to, te to pay teachers because they've got to try and keep that price point low. I think that's part of it. Maybe, though, a sort of a compromise, again, I'm just thinking of this now based on your idea, is um, it may just be a change of mindset. But like I said, a lot of school choice people reflexively do not like unions. They're like, the unions are the problem. we got to get rid of the unions. We shouldn't allow collective bargaining. Um, and I don't have a problem with unions as long as your decision to join a union is not coerced. And as long as the employer, in this case, private schools, as long as you're working with the union isn't mandated by law. So maybe uh, some sort of compromises. There are states that have right to work laws that I think go beyond just the idea of you can't be forced to work, uh, to, to be unionized, where they say you cannot be required to be unionized by your employer. Right. That goes beyond a right to work. That goes, now government is telling employers that you cannot require someone to be in a union. And I think we could see compromise in states where say, no, we'll leave it up to the employer what they want to do. And if they want to work with a union, that is totally fine. And we're not going to interfere. And maybe that is a compromise, at least in some states that have those laws. Right. Yeah, that could be good. I just, you know, teachers like to say, and I, as a teacher, I hesitate at this. But they say, you know, oh, we're the experts in the classroom. Just trust us. And I'm like, well, you know, I, I know some of you and I'm not sure if I do. Right. But something like that, where it allows some influence from that classroom teacher, I think it would, would resolve at least some of the conflict and potentially create a gateway, create a doorway to something closer to the school choice that, that, you know, you're, you're proposing. Um, now, all right. So I know we've been at this for a while. I got two questions we're going to wrap up with here. Uh, and one is we emailed about this. And so you get to answer this however you want. And the last one is just sort of the, for fun, the books and movies, but for you, um, what would be the ideal school? Okay. So if you were given a budget, a building, uh, whatever, you could go in the forest, you could have an RV, you could have a traditional school building for you. What do you think would be the ideal school? What should school look like? Huh. Well, yeah, this is just for me because, like I said, all kids are different. All people are different. They want different things. And I want a system where they all have an equal ability to choose those things and to, for teachers and educators to create what they think is the right school. Um, you know, and, and if money weren't a, a, a concern, a consideration, oh, I suppose that you know, I would want a school, it depends on the age. Certainly when I, if, I, if you know, it was grade school, Neil, I would want a school that teaches the reading, the writing, the math. Um, I want to learn a lot of historical fact. Um, I want to learn, you know, at least the basics of science, of you know, chemistry and biology and things like that. I want to be sort of well-rounded, but then... <laughs> Then, uh, you know, once we get more into the ideal, I sort of imagine, you know, by high school, I'm in a school that, you know, looks like it's out of England, where royalty goes, there's a lot of wood, uh, and, <laughs> and stone, old stone buildings. Uh, yeah, and you, but you sit around a table, sort of college colloquium style, and you, and you're, you know, there may be 15 of you and you sit and you talk, you maybe you read great philosophy it could be a classics program or something like that uh and you sit and you 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 read good stuff and you spend a lot of time talking about it and discussing it to me that would be ideal but i also would say that when i was that age you know in middle school that probably wouldn't work for me because i'd be like i don't care yeah. uh and then by <laughs> high school you know it took a little while before i decided you know, i, I Something triggered actually in middle school, I think, where I really got into politics, started reading a lot of political stuff. And then I would have liked to just debate those things. But there probably would have been stuff like philosophy, you know, non-political philosophy. I thought, man, I don't want to do that. But, you know, me now, that would be the ideal school is you get the basic building blocks, you get good content. And toward the end of K through 12, you get to do a lot of talking and discussing. I love it. That's actually, that's pretty close to where I'm at. My, my answer is very similar. 
Um, I really think we could run high schools a lot more like a college, sort of take a college and a trade school and slap them together and create create choice for the students in terms of how they want to focus. The kids who want to talk, talk, and the kids who want the labs, do the labs, um, which is not terribly cost efficient, but certainly certainly provides sort of the, the support and the opportunities for all those different things. Um, yeah. And by the way, what you just described is like, you know, if I could teach a class, that's essentially the class I'd be teaching, you know, mm -hmm. and if I could cut my 26 down to 15, that would be great, too. All right. So we got, we got one question and, and one, I always give everybody an open mic. So if you want a minute or two, if there's anything we said that you feel like we didn't do uh, give proper justice to, didn't give enough time, or if you want to clarify it, you're free to do that. And then just a couple of books or movies that you would like to recommend. They can be education related or just for fun. I know you did send me some titles that I'll link in the show notes, but you can recommend those or anything else. What are some books or movies you think people should check out? Is there anything else you'd like to mention before we wrap this thing up? Yeah, uh, there was something we just were talking. Oh, right. There's one thing I'd just clarify um, about the school, you know, my ideal school. Uh, you mentioned something about uh, trades. Uh, again, it's really important for me to note, I have to note this because it's my job, is that I am not prescribing a particular school for anyone. And I do actually think it's really important to recognize that for far too long, we have, I think, in policy, but also sort of culturally marginalized people who want to do what we call vocational education. It's often very now high tech education. Um, but I think there are a lot of people who don't want an academic track and we absolutely need to make it a viable option to not go to the wood and stone school where everybody talks about Plato or something like that. And that is just as valuable in my estimation. In fact, <laughs> I, I can't really do anything of practical value. I wish I could. Um, and, you know, I, I often sit around thinking, man, if only I had some ability to do electrical work without fear I was going to kill myself, I could probably get these lamps to work. But anyway, so that's, that would be my one thing that we didn't touch on, but it's related to the ideal school is a lot of people have a very different ideal. And in particular, we've got to get away from this idea that you're somehow less than other people of you don't go to college. We need people with lots of skills. Um, and, and I think school choice is important because we can start to open a lot more of that without the coercion people feel because they say, well, are we going to go to the old German system where you take a, a test when you're eighth grade and then you get tracked either to go to college or not? We don't want that, but we do want lots of viable options. Uh, in terms of movies or books, I wish I could say I watched more movies that had any educational value. Um, <laughs> I don't. I usually watch movies just to entertain myself. Um, uh, what was uh, I did try to watch with my kids Dead Poet Society recently. That was a no go. No. Um, oh. So, so uh, maybe too young at this point. Uh, in any <laughs> event, so I don't know about movies. Uh, I do have some books though that uh, I go to a lot when I'm writing papers. Or when I, I think that there's a particular perspective that's been left out of education discussions. Uh, the Myth of the Common School by Charles Glenn, I think, is a book that everybody should read. Um, because what I at least feel like I hear a lot is what I mentioned before is people will just say as, as if it is fact that the public school system is the foundation of our democracy and it's what brings us together. And the Myth of the Common School is really an analysis of early United States, so in New England with Horace Mann, how common schools actually came about and how common or not common they actually were. And then looking at the Netherlands and France, and uh, I think Prussia's in there too, of these models that Americans were looking at and saying, well, look, this really works. This is what brings people together. But it turns out in many cases, they weren't actually bringing people together very well, or they had some bad outcomes. I think that's important to begin to get a sense of there's more to the history than what I, I feel like people are often told. Um, there are lots of books, by the way, I think people should read. I mentioned The Nature of Prejudice by Gordon Alport. That's not specifically an education book, but it is a book about how do we start to overcome our differences, often thinking about race, but also religion. He talks about all sorts of differences. And I, I think that is just a, a, a terrific book for people to start thinking about how they think about things like race and people they don't know and other groups and how you can start to bridge these divides with people. And so I use that one a lot. 
in part because it's kind of the nucleus of my theory about how this could work in education. Uh, and then because I think the history is so important, if you really got a lot of time on your hands, Lawrence Kremen, who was at Columbia, um, he wrote a very large three volume history of American education that is really sort of, uh, if you've got time, an outstanding read because it goes beyond this idea that education is synonymous with schooling and looks at sort of the breadth of how people were educated starting in the colonial periods, ending at 1980, I think, or maybe 1981, uh, because that's when he stopped writing the book. He may have died, not the books, he may have died not long after that. And so if you got some time, that, those three books are really an excellent overview uh, of American educational history. And there are lots of others, but I've probably already gone on too long. Fantastic. No, it's good. And, and, you know, we'd be remiss if we did not mention that you were recently the co-editor of School Choice Myths, Setting the Record Straight on Education and Freedom. Uh, and I know that one was pretty recent, right? That was in the last couple of year, two years? Well, that came out in October. Okay. Yeah. I say, I know that one was, that was good. Um, and you're not remiss for not mentioning it. I'm remiss for not mentioning it. Hey, well, well, you know, it makes you more trustworthy that you're not just, you know, rabidly self-promoting. I, I should have mentioned it earlier. Um, and then you got a couple other here, uh, others here too. We got co-editor or editor on unprofitable schooling, examining causes of and fixes for America's broken ivory tower and author of, I think you mentioned this one, author of Feds in the Classroom, How Big Government Corrupts, Cripples, and Compromises American Education. So you've, uh, in addition to having some good recommendations, you've got some of your own work that people should be checking out as well. Um, if uh, people want to learn more or maybe want to get in touch with you, I know you're on Twitter, at Neil McCluskey, and I'll link that. Is there anywhere else people should check out where they can either learn more about you or get in touch if they have questions? Uh, sure. Well, you can just go to the Cato Institute website, which is www.cato.org. Uh, and you, there's a tab on there that says experts. I think it still says that. But if not, just look at the tabs and they're pretty self-explanatory. Uh, and then I think it says policy scholars and you can just find me that way. I would tell you what the address is directly to get to my uh, page. But I don't know what that is. That's or you can you can Google me. I mean, that's a that's another way to find it. And then that page is a way to access, I think, just about everything I've ever written. That is, well, at least since I've been at Cato. So that's been since awesome. two thousand three. Well, that's a long time. Yeah, um, nice. yeah. So it's all there. Fantastic. Yeah. So I, I got to figure out how to get my name under a tab that says experts. That's, <laughs> that's you fantastic. You have your own podcast. So you yeah, I know. I made, I made my own tab. tab. <laughs> made yeah. my own tab. There we go. All right. Well, ladies and gentlemen, this has been the Class Cast podcast. We've been speaking with Neil McCluskey, the director of the Center for Educational Freedom at the Cato Institute. You can contact him, as he said, uh, at, at Neil McCluskey on Twitter and through the Cato uh, Institute website, www.cato.org. You can find the ClassCast podcast on all major streaming services, plus YouTube, and at www.classcastpodcast.com. Thank you very much, and have a great day. 